good morning to everyone from Washington, D.C., and a warm welcome from the Africa Center to all our alumni, colleagues, and partners from across Africa joining us for today's webinar, Taking Stock of African Peace Operations. My name is Nate Allen, and I am Assistant Professor of Security Studies here at the Africa Center. I am the Africa Center's faculty lead on peace support operations, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Uh, uh, today's webinar is a first in a series we will be hosting, taking stock of African peace operations and sharing insights for improving the regional security architecture. Before we proceed, I'd like to pass the microphone to the Africa Center's director, Kate omquist Knopf, for a brief word of welcome. Kate, over to you. Thank you, Nate, and uh, good day uh, to everyone. Uh, welcome again uh, to all the Africa Center's alumni, distinguished colleagues, and friends. Thank you for joining us in this program today. The Africa Center for Strategic Studies, as many of you know, serves as a forum for research, academic programs, and the exchange of ideas with the aim of enhancing citizen security by strengthening the effectiveness and accountability of African institutions. We are a Department of Defense Regional Center located at the National Defense University in Washington, DC. We carry out our mission of advancing African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions. Accordingly, we seek to generate relevant insight and analysis that informs practitioners and policymakers on topical and emerging security trends and on effective responses to dynamic and complex security challenges. Recognizing that addressing serious challenges can only come about through candid and thoughtful exchanges, the Africa Center provides opportunities for partners to exchange views on shared interests and best practices. By engaging with our African partners, military and civilian, government and civil society, as well as national and regional, we hope to reinforce that we all have valuable roles to play in mitigating the complex drivers of conflict and insecurity on the continent today through enduring and capable institutions. This kind of dialogue infused with real world experiences and fresh analysis, we hope provides an opportunity for continued learning and catalyzes concrete actions. So thank you once again for joining us today for this conversation on African peace operations. I look forward to the discussion. Back to you, Nate. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, and let's begin today's discussion, which I think could not be more timely. It's hard to believe that it's been nearly 20 years since the founding of the African Union and the African peace and security architecture along with it. And today, I think it's fair to say we are at a moment of strategic uncertainty and change surrounding the future of peace operations in Africa. Uh, five years ago, uh, we had the opportunity to host a roundtable on this book uh, entitled The Future of African Peace Operations, uh, an event we linked to in the required readings for today's session. And the reason we, we linked to this event and we highly recommend this book is I think it was and is and remains one of the most insightful readings on the past, present, and future of African peace operations. And we are very fortunate to have with us today Dr. Cedric de Koning, one of the book's uh, editors, and an another contributor, Dr. Linda Darkwa, here to join our distinguished alumni, General Martin Luther Agwe, today. So I'll introduce the panelists and get right to our questions. So first, Dr. Cedric de Koning is a research professor in the Research Group on Peace, Conflict, and Development at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. He has over 30 years of experience in research, policy advising, and training in peacekeeping and conflict resolution. He co-directs New Peace Center on the United Nations and Global Governance manages the training program and coordinates the effective of peace operations now the effectiveness of peace operations network he has authored numerous books he reviewed journal articles and policy briefs on peacekeeping in africa next we have with us dr linda darkwa who is a senior research fellow at the lagan center for international affairs and diplomacy at the university of ghana where she teaches courses in international and humanitarian law Dr. Darko's research focuses on the institutionalization for processes of enhancing peace and security through Africa's multilateral institutions. She has published numerous publications to that effect, including her contribution to the future of African peace operations I just mentioned. And finally, we have General Martin Luther Agwe, 
who, as many of you are aware, has had an extremely long and distinguished career in the Nigerian military. First commissioned as an officer in 1972, he rose through the ranks to become a four-star general and chief of defense staff in 2006. He has extensive experience serving in and commanding peace operations, first as deputy force commander to the United Nations mission in Sierra Leone, followed by service as the first force commander of the African Union United Nations hybrid mission in Darfur. Uh, he is a graduate of the National Defense University uh, here in DC and among our most distinguished alumni. So first, uh, we're gonna start uh, with, with you, Cedric. Um, at, at the at the, and I encourage our other panelists can can turn on their their um, video as well. So at the at the 2016 book launch, you made a forceful case for what might be called an African model of peace operations. You pointed how uh, non non impartiality, um, kind of the strategic variation in modalities through which African actors intervened, and a partnership centered focus was part of what distinguished this Africa centric model of peace operations. So my question to you is, how do you think this argument has held up? Is there still what you might call an African model of peace operations? And if so, what are its characteristics? And how would you say the model has evolved since we last had this conversation nearly half a decade ago? Thanks, Nate. Uh, when you say it, that, it feels uh, very long ago. But uh, I great to be, to be back. Thank you for the African Center for hosting us uh, today. And, and great to continue this conversation. I think we, we do have an African model of peace operations that, that have emerged and that will continue to, to evolve. So I don't think it's static, but I think the, the, the four main characteristics that we, we outlined in the book is, is still very much uh, valid. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll just quickly go through them. The, the first one was that African peace operations, I think, is different from, for instance, uh, UN, NATO, EU, or other types of peace operations in that they are all kind of extra territorial. Whereas with the African Union uh, and African other African peace operations, it is about managing the union and managing peace and conflict within the union. So in that sense, it's more of a, an act of solidarity of engaging with your own rather than it is a kind of an extraterritorial type of expeditionary type of peace operations. And secondly, of course, important to, to emphasize that it is peace support operations, not peacekeeping operations that, that, that has really evolved in the African context. So it's not about ceasefire or peace agreement implementations. It has mostly been about stabilization, counterterrorism, counterinsurgency, and, and one of the reasons because of that, for that is, is partly because, of course, this Africa's role in the large international context and about division of work and so forth. And the third uh, characteristic that I think is important to highlight is the, the element of partnership. Uh, African operations are well, also true for UN and other operations, but I think will 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 highly unlikely that they will ever operate on their own. They will always operate alongside the United Nations operations or special political missions, uh, EU training and other forms of EU operations and so forth. So it's very much about uh, partnership coordination. And then it's about um, the different types of support models and relationships that there are between the African operation and the other international operations. And then the last thing I wanted to highlight in terms of these characteristics is the variety. There isn't just one fixed template of African Union peace operations. We've had operations carried out under the auspices or the, the mandate and management control of the African Union, like the missions in Burundi and Darfur. We have AMISOM, which I would say is more like an African Union-led coalition of the willing co-managed very much by, by the troop contributing countries. You've had operations undertaken by the regional economic communities like recently in Lesotho or earlier in the Central African Republic or in Gambia. And then we also have this uh, new phenomenon of ad hoc regional arrangements like the operations we had well in the past also with the Lord's Resistance Army in the Great Lakes region, but more pronounced recently with the multinational joint task force in the Lake Chart Basin Commission and with the G5 Sahel force in, in, in the Sahel. 
and in Mali. So it's about recognizing this, this flexibility, this variety of operations, not having very much a template fixed uh, cookie cutter approach to, to operations in, in the African context. And so these are the four main characteristics. And of course, they then have implementation uh, implications, I think, for, for how you approach them for partnership with these operations. And perhaps the last thing I'll, I'll emphasize is the financing of these operations. Uh, because Africa is not financially independent when it comes to managing these operations, the type of operations and the scope of these operations are very much influenced also by what the partners are willing to support when it comes to African Union peace support operations. So I think that's another important element. I've emphasized partnership before, but just to emphasize that, because as I mentioned before, the type of operations are then also influenced by you know, what the international partners are willing to support when it comes to African Union peace support operations. I also think that the financial part, like we see with the United Nations peacekeeping at the moment, will be a major driver in how these operations evolve in the future. We are entering a post-COVID-19 global recession, there's less appetite for large operations. So I think African and adapt and become smaller and more specialized. And let me stop there and hand back to you, Nate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cedric. I think you make a really compelling case that kind of distinguishes how we should understand African peace operations from maybe more traditional UN uh, peacekeeping. Uh, nevertheless, there's been a lot of research about the effectiveness of UN peacekeeping, but kind of relatively little on African-led peace operations, as you have kind of so nicely laid out. So kind of in your view, are there any lessons we can draw out? What, under, under what circumstances would you say African-led peace operations are successful in meeting their strategic objectives? And when do they face challenges? And, and can you draw on any, are there any recent insights from either the work of the Effective Peace Operations Network or more recently, the scholarly literature that can help us understand uh, when African-led peace operations are successful. Thanks, yes. I mean, you, you've mentioned the, the, the effectiveness of peace operations network. We undertook a, a number of studies, um, uh, one into the African mission in Somalia, um, very recently on the hybrid operation, African Union, United Nations operation in Darfur, a couple of others. Linda has also been been part of, of, of uh, at least two of those two of those uh, research studies, and a, a number of factors are starting to emerge out of this research into the effectiveness of specific operations. I think I will highlight three. Um, the first one is that uh, well, let me before I go into into the specific factors, let me first say that we find that it's most missions have periods where they are more effective and periods where they are less effective. And so it's maybe more interesting to understand why is the particular mission more effective at certain times than in others than, than to try to make an overall judgment over a 20 year period, let's say if a mission has been effective or not. So with that uh, framing, I would say that we find that missions are more effective when the, during periods where there's a clear political project where there's a large degree of coherence uh, amongst, uh, well, with the host nation, with countries in the region, with the African Union, with the United Nations Security Council members, uh, key partners. When you have these moments where there's a great extent of coherence or degree of coherence around a particular political project and what the role of the mission should be in that project, uh, that's when missions are most effective. Unfortunately, this is actually rarely the case where you have this, this alignment of, of planets or stars, if you like, which give you this, this perfect moment of, of impact. So a lot of the what we can do to enhance the effectiveness operations is to do this political work, this diplomatic work, to build this coherence, to build support, to build political will for particular operations. And it's also interesting because it's kind of one of the most important factors for influence. And of course, it's not really in the hand of the mission itself. They play a role, but it's very much in the hand of, of diplomats and, and politicians at all different kinds of levels. So I think this is the most important 
uh, factor. Uh, secondly, and going closely with that, I would say is, is understanding the role of the use of force in peace operations. Um, military force can create the opportunity for stability, but if that opportunity is not realized through political progress, uh, through governance, through law enforcement, through basic services, through development, through peace building, then that stability will be uh, only temporary or that security will be only temporary. And so matching the, the military dimension, uh, the, the physical security and stability dimension with the governance and political uh, elements of, of, of peace operations is extremely important and, and I think very much neglected often in, in peace operations in general and, and in the African context especially. And a recent good example is, uh, you know, in, in response to the Boko Haram attacks in, in, in northern Nigeria and the Lake Chad region, we had first the multinational joint task force deploying. But I think after a couple of years, the African Union, the countries in the region, partners realized that this, this military operation is not enough on its own. And uh, then there was a very successful effort to establish a Lake Chad Basin regional stabilization strategy to bring the political and developmental and governance elements into the whole operation or into the whole effort. And I think that's a very good example of this combination of governance, civilian stabilization, peace building, et cetera, matching the, the military element. And lastly, I would say the third element is, is the element of adequate resources. It's, it's a kind of an obvious one, but just to, to emphasize, you know, that in, in the African context, if you take a mission like the African mission in, in Sudan uh, that General Agwai led and was involved in, when that mission, the African Union mission, uh, the, the budget was about $500 million. When it became a UN led and, and a UN joint UNAU operation, the budget increased fourfold to about 2 billion US dollars. I mean, if you look at Amison today, the African mission in Somalia, the budget's about a billion dollars or the cost is about a billion dollars. If that were to somehow become a UN mission, I'm pretty sure it, the budget will be more than I mean, 2 billion US dollars. So the huge gap between what the UN would invest in resources in these type of operations and what the African Union and partners are able to, to put together for these operations, show you the extent to which most of these African operations have operate with far less resources than equivalent operations. This is especially related to mobility, to aviation and so forth. And so I think this is of course a very important factor, but not as important as the political factor. I mean, AMISOM has shown us that even with limited resources, you can be successful but you will not be successful no matter how many resources you have if you don't have a clear political project to support. So I think these are some of the key lessons that are coming out of our research. Back to you, Nate, thank you. Thank you very much, Cedric. What, a, what an excellent kind of very concise response. Um, Linda, I wanna go to, to you. So Cedric mentioned a little earlier a bit about how the African model of peace operations developed in part as a response to the rise of irregular threats I mean, stabilization missions like terrorism, transnational crime, uh, piracy. And this was a topic you discussed in your contribution to the, the future of African peace operations. Um, so my question to you is, how have efforts by the African Union and regional organizations evolved since you contributed this chapter to meet irregular threats? And how would you judge their success? Uh, you're muted, I think. Thank you. So thank you very much for this webinar. The topic I think is very timely. Um, certainly, uh, significant strides have been made since the publication of the of the book, The Futures of um, Peace Operations. Um, the AU has utilized its experiences. Uh, gained from the years of engagement, uh, whether it's in Somalia or it's in Sudan, uh, 
uh, to address some of the complex security challenges that not just the African continent, but the, the world in general is confronted with. Um, so the development right after the uh, continental field exercise, which was used to test the operational readiness of the African standby force, a um, five-year strategic plan was put in place, and this was done with the aim of enhancing the operationalization of the African standby force. And so the implementation of that plan has actually led to the development of significant capacities um, towards addressing contemporary security threats. Um, at the uh, strategic level, uh, I believe that the Commission has been able to align or better align the mechanisms between the political, the legal, and the operational aspect of strategic decision making relating to peace support operations, which has led to a much more smoother um, mandating, political mandating process. Um, and uh, also, in addition to this, is the fact that significant uh, strategic concepts have been developed particularly to address areas where there was a lack of policy. So one of the identified um, uh, challenges with the African standby force concept was the fact that the police was underdeveloped. And so right after the um, exercise, the African Union working with partners like the Training for Peace program launched straight into the development of policies to guide policing. And now they've got uh, an African Union policy on international policing that guides all policing efforts in peace support operations, but also in special political missions. Um, it is noteworthy that I think two or three days ago, the African Union has also adopted a policy on peace support operations, a doctrine actually on AU peace support operations. And what this doctrine does is that it provides scope and strategic guidance for the African Union to be able to utilize all of the tools that are available to it for addressing contemporary peace and security challenges. Linked to the development of uh, strategic level guidance and policies uh, is also the development of capabilities for addressing maritime insecurity, uh, particularly piracy, which has been on the uh, search and which had uh, inadvertently been omitted from the ASF concept. At the level of the Secretariat, and here I'm talking about the African Union Commission and the commissions of the RECs and the RMs, we also see um, improved coordination and communication between the technical uh, level offices. And this has in turn facilitated better responses to technical level requirements for strengthening the ability of Africa to better respond to its peace and security challenges. Um, in the area of force preparation also, right from what the benefits of the continental field exercise, a number of uh, regional economic communities and the regional mechanisms have actually conducted regional uh, training exercises to test their capacities and their capabilities. And the African Union itself tested its uh, uh, communications uh, and coordination mechanisms as a result of the recommendations of the, of the um, continental field exercise. In addition, a process has been put in place for the verification of uh, pledge capabilities. So uh, certainly the African Union has not deployed the African standby force in its organic form, but because of all of these mechanisms that have been put in place and policies and training, we can say that the African Union is much, much better placed now than it was when the, the book was uh, written to be able to respond to the peace and security challenges confronting the continent. Thank you very much, Linda. So you, you developed, you mentioned some of the Rex developing doctrine and, and Cedric has also highlighted financing, which I think, you know, makes it evident that one of the key facets of contemporary peacekeeping and peace operations across Africa is the importance, uh, as Cedric alluded to, of strategic partnerships. So this is an area that you also have written a lot about uh, as well. So uh, I'm curious, um, under what conditions, why, why do you think are strategic partnerships between the African Union, the regional economic communities, and the United Nations 
uh, so important in achieving success in African peace operations. And in your view, if you can maybe add a little bit, what, what are the key ingredients of successful strategic partnerships? Um, thank you. I think all of us here know that the transnational nature of contemporary security threats uh, makes it impossible for any one state, region, continent, or multilateral organization to be able to address it effectively. And so the only way to guarantee uh, security is collective security. Now, we're also aware that there are limitations to what the United Nations is able to do, uh, primarily because of its own constitutive documents and the limitations imposed on, on it. There are limitations to what the African Union is able to do and so on and so forth. And so we don't have a choice. We, we really need to form strategic partnerships to be able to address our collective uh, security efforts we are confronted with existential threats and the only way we can survive is through these uh, partnerships. Uh, so having said that, uh, I believe that uh, there are maybe four or five ingredients for uh, a successful strategic partnership. And I have uh, mentioned these in um, a paper that I, I did for um, the Challenges Forum on Action for Peacekeeping, the, uh, the Secretary General's initiative. So the first one is the uh, principle of equality. I think that it's absolutely critical that the shared need and mutual benefits of the partnership to all involved, irrespective of size and or contribution is highlighted. It's important that this consideration is the primary consideration that guides the relationship because each partner comes to the, uh, to the arrangement or the partnership with certain, um, certain capabilities. We may not all have the same capabilities, but we have comparative advantages in what we bring to the table. And this must be acknowledged and, and respected. Inherent in the principle of equality is trust. And the effectiveness and efficiency of partnerships is dependent on the level of respect and trust that is invested and nurtured in that relationship. So it's important to acknowledge partner experiences. It must also, uh, the principal must also consider and value uh, opinion, partner opinions in decision-making processes, irrespective of uh, the level of the, the uh, members of the partnership. The second point uh, relates to transparency, and I think that it's quite linked uh, to the principle of uh, equality. And here, the principle of transparency hinges on genuineness and uh, commitment on the part of all partners to ensure that the partnership is able to deliver on the expected goals. Uh, so to be able to have this uh, work effectively, there is need to have uh, clarity on policies, processes, organizational cultures, there are things that the UN may not be able to do, there are things that the AU may be able to do, but some works may not be able to do, and all of that. And transparency in a partnership means that there must be some assumptions that are rooted in verifiable facts and uh, certainty on agreed upon expectations by all. So uh, we should, as much as possible, minimize the element of surprise in uh, such strategic partnerships. Partnerships like this um, must also really uh, be complementary, um, recognizing the individual strengths of the different members of the partnership so that we are able to uh, carve out a clear division of labor based on the two principles of equality and transparency so that we can minimize our competition and enhance our considerations. We, we should not be naive, given the political nature of the entities in the partnership. Strategic interest will always, always be a key consideration. Um, and the, the quest for plaudits by all must be acknowledged and factored into efforts at identifying comparative advantage and labor division. It's important here to say that comparative advantage should not be limited to um, having an entity with the best capabilities to what it does best, but must also be extended to developing the capacities of the entities that are part of the partnership, but that may not necessarily have all of the capabilities that are required. Um, the partnerships, these partnerships must also uh, be results oriented. And I think that over the years, the African Union and the United Nations have actually enhanced their ability to sharpen the focus of results orientation. 
um, uh, but you still need to reach, not reach to, but enhance the tooling of the partnership between the African Union and the United Nations to be able to better deliver on the objectives, especially as we are confronted with threats that are uh, beyond uh, either organization. Finally, is the issue of uh, funding. Um, the provision of predictable, sustainable, and flexible resources, including funding for AU peace operations, is fundamental to improving peacekeeping partnerships. Um, the UN is unable to address uh, contemporary security challenges, as I mentioned earlier. And so it has been left to the continental organization to work um, with the UN and other partners to fulfill the mandate of maintaining international peace and security. Um, uh, however, the, the issue of financing still remains one of uh, tension between the African Union and the United Nations. And it is important that this is resolved in good time to be able to enhance the strategic partnership that exists. Right. Thank you very, very much, uh, Linda, for those really insightful uh, remarks. Um, so we're going to turn to you, General Agway. I think that, that Cedric and Linda have left an awful lot on the table for us to chew on, and I'd like you to break some of this down for us, given your experience as a military leader within the context of, of peace operations. So my question to you is, first of all, to speak a little bit about the challenges. What were the main strategic challenges you faced uh, commanding the AU mission in Darfur, for example, feel free to bring in other experiences in peace operations as you like. And, and more broadly, what do you think the main strategic challenges are that confront the African Union as it seeks to develop peace operations capabilities that meet 21st century threats? Uh, thank you very much and also thank the African Center for inviting me to join uh, others on this this very uh, interesting discussion. And I think uh, both uh, Cedric and Linda have actually covered a lot of ground. And sitting down here, I'm so happy that years after I have actually left uh, operationalization of some of the principles and theories at that time that led to some of the several challenges we had in the field, that uh, things are beginning to improve. And, uh, and I'm happy that African Union have un actually understood the... Uh, uh, we seem to have be having some technical difficulties with uh, General Agwe, who hopefully will be able to rejoin us um, in, in a second. Um, so I'm actually ho ho hoping and hoping that he will uh, return. Um, I will a couple of, a couple other questions I will I will ask uh, some of the other panelists. So picking up, uh, I want to go to Linda on something that you mentioned and, and to talk about some of the um, uh, issues that I know are are important both to the Africa Center as well as our alumni. Um, one issue that has only kind of increased importance in in recent years is. The, the topic of, of gender, right? Um, uh, and my question, I'd like to hear from you, Linda, first. Um, how do you assess the degree of, of progress that, that the African Union and the regional organizations have made in including female decision makers, um, but also I think importantly in taking into account some of the gendered perspectives around conflict, that is how conflict affects both men and women and the need to kind of develop approaches that, that deal with those gender dimensions of, of conflict. So Linda, if you have any, any insight. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think that uh, uh, significant progress has been made in certain aspects of engendering um, uh, peace and security efforts on the continent, um, but there are still miles to go in other areas. So, for example, when it comes to, you know, signaling the intent of the African Union to enhance and to ensure the inclusion of women um, or, and gender 
in its decision making processes, but more importantly, in peace, security and governance issues. I think that the declaration, the solemn declaration on gender equality by the uh, leaders of uh, the continent is a good signal. I also think that the Maputo Protocol, which provides actually a, a very strong framework for women's uh, participation in all spheres of life is also a good signal. So in terms of policy, policy uh, domain and strategic frameworks, I think that the, the African Union has done very, very well. Two years ago, it actually went on to develop the Continental Results Framework, which is complementary to other reporting mechanisms uh, for its member states to report on progress made, particularly in the areas of um, the women, peace and security architecture. I think that there is considerable knowledge of the architecture on the continent um, uh, at the various levels, whether it's strategic, operational or tactical. And here I'm just borrowing the military terminology, not to say that it is just limited to, uh, to the military or to the police. Um, and I think that knowledge uh, by the critical uh, yeast of actors has helped to translate some of these things into real action. However, um, I think that there are challenges when it comes to resourcing the women, peace and security architecture on the continent generally. And the women, peace and security architecture is the framework for enhancing uh, participation, representation, inclusion, but also uh, mainstreaming gender into considerations. What we see, for example, is that a number of countries have developed national action plans, but these national action plans are not very well resourced. Um, we need to ask ourselves, where are the women? Uh, notwithstanding the successes with the development of the very impressive architecture that uh, I just spoke about, the, and, and acknowledging the fact that numbers in themselves are not enough. Numbers are good. Numbers are important, but in themselves they are not enough. We realize that women are still by and large missing. Um, and there are a number of structural reasons why women are missing in the decision-making processes. It's important to ask ourselves, where are the women at national level? Because when we talk about having a head of a mediation team, for example, if you look at the profiles of these people, they tend to be people who have served as foreign ministers of their countries, for example, you know, at very high levels. So how many female foreign ministers do we have? And then when it comes to translating that onto the continental level by appointing very senior people into some of these positions, we are unable to find them because we have not groomed and developed enough um, at national level. And the same can be said uh, for, for the militaries and for the police in, in, in the continent. I think that we need to... Um, also talk about breaking the silos because what we have uh, is a lot of, you know, silosization of the WPS agenda or the Women, Peace and Security agenda. Um, and we see that there is a lot of efforts placed in providing gendered analysis, uh, a lot of efforts placed in ensuring that we put in place gender desk and gender focal persons, but the, the issue of gender is not well integrated and mainstreamed into uh, plans, policies, and processes. And because of this, budgets for implementing the WPS agenda tends to be quite limited. Um, because, you know, it's an add-on, it's, it's still in silos instead of being mainstream and integrated. And so I think the continent still has a lot of work to be done. We need to pay attention to what can be done in the immediate and short term, but also we need to have a much more long-term strategy uh, for developing and nurturing talent, which can then be used at the continental and the global level, I dare say, um, in enhancing the gender agenda. Uh, and on the on the issue of you know addressing the the question of uh, gender being about men and women, I think the African Union has actually done quite well in that. Again, there is still a lot that can be done, but I think we've shifted 
from just looking at gender through what can be done for women to recognizing women's agency and also recognizing that it is absolutely critical to pay attention to the uh, implications of all actions on men and women because we can have backlashes when we do not do that properly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. So we're getting close to the time where we would normally take questions for the audience, and I want to reserve some potential time to be able to have General Agwe speak if he potentially uh, is able to rejoin us. Um, before we formally start taking audience questions, really briefly back to both of you, I'd like to ask, well, starting with Cedric, if there is one concrete thing that each of you think that uh, the African Union or the RECs ought to do to advance the cause of, of peace operations in Africa, uh, what would it be? One, one major step, uh, Cedric? Nate, I have a bit of a problem with this kind of what is the one step we can do mm -hmm. questions because it kind of assumes that there are one step answers. When, when all the knowledge point to, you know, the complex ways in which uh, what we do are interconnected and, and how under unduly prioritizing or over prioritizing one or other aspect will create we know will create perverse side effects. But if I'm pressed, I would say that African leaders need to recognize that, that peace operation, peace support operations is, is not only utilizing uh, military capabilities, uh, is not only about the use of coercive force, but it's rather that it's an instrument that can support a peace process, provided that there's a clear political project to support. So the main effort has to be political and diplomatic. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Linda. Um, so I, I greatly align with Cedric's point. And to add to that is the need for us to also focus a lot more on peace strengthening um, and, and reconstruction and development efforts. In the past, these had tended to be post-conflict uh, activities. But what we, we've come to realize, if you take the example of Somalia, for example, is that there is you know, uh, armed violence ongoing in parts of Somalia, but there is um, some level of uh, stability in other parts of Somalia. So we cannot wait. We cannot have um, a system where we wait to have peace before we engage in peace building efforts, conflict prevention and stabilization efforts. And we need to develop uh, a system of being able to implement these side by side in peace support operations. 